Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that there is a glorious balance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I appreciate the, the burden that Tony has because, you know, what we are in a practical sense and how we live is very, very much a part of the gospel. And, uh, you know, we see it, if you read Paul's letters to the churches, they're full of exhortations as to how people are supposed to live. And the, the, the devil has a way of undermining people's understanding of this and how it is that it's supposed to happen. And some of you, uh, you know, many of you heard at least a recording, if you didn't hear it live, the, the recording of... Brother Carter Conlon's message, The Shout of a King. And uh, he came to the Lord among a people who tended to take holy living very, very seriously. But their concept of a very successful preacher was somebody who could really bring it to preach against sin. And so they would, every message would be some really serious, zealous uh, preach, message against a certain kind of a sin. And, and the, whole, the whole intent of that, where they were going with it, was to get people at the end of the service to come down and cry and pray and repent of that sin. And that was considered a very successful service in which God really moved. And you remember how he testified that he came to a place in his life when he looked back and he realized, we're just going around in circles here. This is not working. Nothing is really changing. The same people keep coming back and coming back and coming back, and nothing ever changes. Isn't there more to the gospel than that? And so the Lord began to open his understanding. And I appreciate the fact that there's a, you know, man, is that honest? We need to be honest. Every one of us needs to be corrected and balanced in our thinking. And, uh, you know, I had the same reaction that you did, Brother Carl, about uh, going on with <laughs> in, in Titus chapter 2. But I thought, as I've listened just of, of Paul's summary of the gospel, I believe one of his summaries in Ephesians 2. It's a very familiar scripture, but it really gives us the balance in, in a very easily uh, memorable way. For it is by grace, verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved. Now grace again is God helping us literally. His spirit coming with power and influence into our hearts and our lives. Through the word usually, typically. And, uh, and in the strength and under the influence of that we now have power to respond to the gospel. And so he says it is by grace you have been saved through faith. So there's that faith that's imparted that needs to be exercised. A sinner needs to come to the place where they're honest enough to say, God, I am lost without you. And not only am, is that a fact, I want you, Lord. From the depths of my soul, without any conditions, I need you. I'm calling upon you based upon your promise to rescue me from my condition. That's what it really comes down to. But you know, it doesn't stop there. The whole, our, whole of our lives is one in which we need salvation. Not just from the guilt of our sins, but from their power to rule over us. And I need him. I, I appreciate so much what I have sensed in, uh, in the church here. I'm sure it's true uh, in the other churches. But so many times we've had people stand up and sing, Lord, I need you. And some songs along that line, there's this, that, song, that theme has just come up in people's conversation and, and in our services. There's a, there's a feeling of need. That's a great thing. That's God at work. But that, that need needs to come to the point where we are able to look to him with, with an understanding that he has what we need and he wants to give it to us. And so it isn't just standing there, oh God, I'm so, such a wretch, I need you, oh, you know. It's not a bunch of poor mouthing. It's, it's the same kind of dynamic that goes on when a sinner comes to Christ. It's God making us aware of a need, making us aware of his supply, and causing us to cry out for that supply. And we lay hold of that by faith that he has given us. So that I can have confidence that he will answer and he will fulfill his purpose. So it is by faith 
It is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. See, it didn't come from you. This is God at work. It is the gift of God. And the reason it's not by works is so that we cannot boast. None of us can look in the mirror and say, hey, I did something that really, and that's the reason God accepted me. Uh, it just doesn't have anything, any part in it. But for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. There's a description of the Christian life in one verse. Where does it all come from? It comes from Him. Where do I, it's, it's one thing to say, you ought to do this, you ought to live this kind of a life, you, you husbands need to behave this way, you wives need to do this, you young people need to do that. That's, that, absolutely. But you know, the devil has so many ways, as I think I said earlier, to undermine this truth. One of them is legalism. Legalism simply is trying to get people to behave the way, they, the way we think God wants them to behave, and, and even if we're right, technically, what it does is demand that from you. You need to dig down, try harder, and, and straighten up and fly right. You know, I remember one, one night we had one of those services that every once in a while I've, I've done this, where we've had a sort of a Bible, an impromptu Bible study on, on uh, Wednesday night, and I'll stand up and I'll propose something and, and solicit response from the congregation, and it's really uh, interesting. And one night I proposed a, a situation or just a scenario. Hey, I just really screwed up. I, I failed. I fell in the mud. Help me out here. And so people were calling out verses and, 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 and so on. And one brother piped up and said, straighten up and fly right. <laughs> so I said, thank you, Moses. <laughs> but you see what's wrong with that? See, I got, in that pro I got in that situation, I wish it were as hypothetical as, as all that, but you know, I got in the, this hypothetical situation because I was trusting in myself. I was looking to hear to give me as the engine for my living. That is a prescription for failure. And folks, if we go to sleep, that's what we tend to default to. We go right back to living according to the dictates and the impulses that arise from our old nature. But that's not salvation. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ. There is a supernatural life that we are given, and God means for that life to be the new engine. I need a new engine. I cannot expect anything from this old nature but failure. And what God wants me to do is transfer my confidence from this to this. But oh, does this not want to die. It does not want to let go. It does not want to admit what it really is. Oh, do we fight it. And pride, yeah. yeah. Every one of us needs to lift up our hands and, you know, whatever we can lift up. To admit to that one, that's the, heart, that's the essence of our nature. Oh, God, we don't want to take that place of dependence, but that's the only place that we, by which we can really become what he wants us to become. I've got to, every day, look to him. I, there's no way I can derive a formula and then say, Oh, God, okay, God, thanks for the formula. Now I'm going to go do it. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way on any level. We need this constant working of God in our hearts, and he's going to be. But we, you know, the thing is, if we just go to sleep, then, then you know, there's a whole lot of time can go by and we're just, we're just, you know, marking time. We're not gaining any ground. We're, in fact, the fact is we're losing ground. We're sliding into places of bondage. Sometimes we don't even realize it. And God, if God is uh, merciful enough to, to shake you up and, and shake up your world, you need to be praising him. Amen. That's God. At work, he's the workman. He's the one. If you know him, you have his supernatural life in you. God, and the whole essence of salvation is I give myself to God. I know I am not what he intended to me, to, me to be when he made me. I am not somebody who is fit to live in the kingdom that he has promised. He's going to have to fix this and replace me and make me into something that I am definitely not in myself. 
That's salvation. I need him. I need him to be that master workman. But oh, it's the work of a lifetime, isn't it? And we do participate. Our wills need to be in that place of expectation and dependence and looking to him. It is God who works in you. But isn't that interesting? He uses the word creation. This is a God who created the universe who is creating something in us. It's something that didn't exist. You talk about being able to live the Christian life. The ability to do that does not exist in these frames. But God is able to speak into us and to create that new newness of life in us that is able to be what we are not in ourselves. But oh, do we need to be willing. But you know, it doesn't happen uh, automatically, does it? That's why we need the exhortation. It's one thing to say, yeah, God's going to work. Well, yeah, he is. And he works by sometimes exhorting us to straighten up and fly right, but to understand where the power comes from. But you know, another way the devil undermines what the Christian life really is about is to so emphasize Christ's substitutionary death for us and the righteousness that is imputed to us that it's almost like, hey, that's good enough. Uh, you know, it's like it's all taken care of. And it really can migrate to the point where it becomes a license to sin. Hey, I don't really have to put out much of an effort. I can kind of slide, I can slip and slide, I can justify what I'm doing because oh, it's all taken care of. Oh my, where do you find that in here? See, you see on the one hand it's legalism, where I'm striving to measure up to something in my own strength. On the other hand, I'm, I'm allowing my, uh, my human nature to express itself in ways that are contrary to what his word says. And I'm just, it's like I'm trying to take advantage of, of what he's done. I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God, folks. He didn't do that so I could have a license to live to the lust and, and, and live to the lust of, these flesh, of this flesh. And to live my life here the way I please. What he's given me is, is the power to live as he pleases. And I have the right to look to him. He has laid a foundation that cannot be shaken. It is the foundation of Christ's death. It isn't just that he died for me, it's that I died. God somehow, you, I can't explain it, but I can tell you it's in the word. God put me and you to death in Christ. And we have the right to, to look the devil in the eye and say, devil, I don't have to give in to that. I died. I don't have to listen to you, devil. I died. What, what am I doing? I'm reckoning on something. I'm counting it as, as so because God says it. The devil says one thing. My nature cries out in, a, in another way. But God says something different. And I have a right to say, I don't have to listen because I died back there. I am reckoning. I am counting on what God says is true. And you know what happens? It becomes true. It's, it enters into my experience. But you see how we, we need to participate. But oh, don't try to do it in your own strength and don't, and don't go against the grace of God and just try to live your own life and do your own thing. We are created in Christ Jesus for what purpose? To do good works. Now, that's a broad category, but that means every form of expression of Christ's life that would come out of us is to be the kind of people that God can point to and say, there's, one, there's my servant. Well, wouldn't it be nice to be like Job in, in one sense? <laughs> I realize he had, a, he had a bad time, he had a rough time. Came out of it great though, didn't he? But where God could actually point to the, uh, talk to the devil and say, have you seen my servant? Tell you what, I want to be somebody that, that God could point a sinner to and say, I want you to have what he has. You know, I love what Tony was referring to. is that saying that somebody came up with a while back. If you were arrested and tried with the crime of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a funny but sobering question. It's not that we act holier than thou. That's not it. Good God, that's awful stuff. That's just self-effort, self-righteousness. We don't have to strive to be 
to put on a show and try to, try to pretend that we're righteous people. But we can believe for the grace of God to strengthen us to be able to do what we know he wants us to do. And it becomes one of yielding and resting and trusting. It's an entirely different dynamic that's going on there. I pray that God, I believe he is teaching us. How many of you have more rest than you've had looking back? Yeah, God's doing something. God is, God is doing a work. And we have a way of wanting that to take certain forms and we want to see certain results. We want to be like, you know, JP, God, why isn't it happening this way? You know, we're all with you, brother. We've all said the same thing. But I appreciate the fact that he was honest enough to bring it out. But I'll tell you what, God is at work. There is a plowing, there is a growing, there is a bringing into a deeper rest. Because the Christian life is not one of, I've got to somehow hang on and make it. God, if you're on the outside looking in, I hope you see something different than that. I know you can't make, I know you can't live this life. God doesn't expect you to. That's why he gives you, that's why he creates something that's brand new. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. But here he says he were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. God will give us the power on the inside. If we will yield to that in faith, we, we can do things that we cannot do in ourselves. And it isn't a matter of doing great stuff. It's not just, you know, healing the sick, raising the dead, although, you know, God can do anything. But you know, we need to start where we're at. How about getting up in the morning and having a good disposition and, and a good thankful spirit and looking to him and doing, just doing the things that God puts in front of us, but doing them as believers, as Christians. There's some very ordinary people in the Bible that God, God, God points to as, uh, you know, somebody who is hospitable, somebody who is, you know, just, what about a Dorcas? I think that's her name in the King James. I forget what it is. Is it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, but yet she was known. She, remember she died and Peter was called in, raised her from the dead? But the whole village was, came around in tears, showing the clothes that she had made them. I mean, God's love was poured out through her in those practical ways. It's not just the spiritual stuff. God, we want to just sort of sanitize it and like we just sort of float through life and don't touch people's lives. But here's a lady who was out touching lives. She knew how to sew. And she did it for Christ. Every single one of us can live where we're at and do what comes to our hands and do it as Christians living out the life that he has given to us. We have what it takes because Jesus has given it to us. He's not looking for one bit of a resource from me. He gives me everything I need. And he wants every one of us to know that we can serve him. Praise God. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that's where... The Lord told you he has the plan. He's the one who set the course. He's the one who arranged what it is that he wants us to do. There might be people here that you have no idea what's, what lies in your path. But if you and I will look to God today and, and learn from him and do what he sets before us with his character and handle it, you, don't, you have no idea what God might be preparing you for later on. Every one of us here can make a difference in this sin-cursed world. And God's called us together to help each other in this process and to exhort one another. You know, Tony talked about the Word, and the Word needs to come out of us. And I thought of a scripture in Colossians 2, I'll just refer to it. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And, and, and it goes on to talk about how that Word comes out in, in thanks and praise and exhortation and, and just, just the... The spirit of, of what we do, you know, everything that we do, every action, every word is an expression of something. But which engine does it come from? Is it an expression of this old nature or of Christ? And I believe the Lord is teaching us 
And this is simply an encouragement, an exhortation. We can't be what we're not right now, but we can, we can be what we are. We can look to God right where we're at, start where we're at. How many have you heard Brother Thomas say that? You start where you're at with what you don't have, or with what you have, something like that. And you start, with, you start in spite of what you don't have. You just start. That's all God's looking for. He's just looking for honest hearts who will say, Lord, you know, I, I, I keep coming back in my mind to, the, to that missionary lady who was struggling with something the Lord was trying to work in her. And, oh, she didn't, you know, her nature just fought against it. And she was, there was a battle going on. But she said, Lord, don't give in to me. How many of you want to pray that? Lord, give me an honest heart. Search me. Tell me the real deal. Show me your ways. And don't give in to me. That's all God's looking for. That's all he's looking for. I'll tell you what, and he is going to be lifted up. He is going to change lives. He's changing lives right now. But I believe there's going to be something that people coming in can see. And it's not just a program. It's not just oratory. It's not any of those things. It's simply Christ dwelling in his people. Because he needs to be the center. This is not about me or you. This is about him. We are his habitation. We are a house for him to live. Well, this is, this is your house. We sang it. The house is not the building. The house is the people. Let's be that kind of a house. Let's let his word dwell in us and flow in us and out of us. Not just in some vague, simple way, but, you know, in ways like Tony was describing. It gets down to the practical, everyday things that we do. It's not like there's a secular life and a spiritual life. It's all meant to be lived by the engine that he has supernaturally put in us. We can do what we need to do. And we can do it because he has empowered us to do it. That's what salvation is about. And we're, he is going to get the glory when we stand there on that day. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I appreciate this tonight. You know, sitting back there and I was thinking about what everyone said. And I appreciate what everyone said. And... Uh, I just had this commandment pop up to me right when I stood up. I was just, I was just trying to go over, go over everything in my mind. and Because uh, I know that sometimes I, I see that I need to do the things of the Lord. And I know he gives me things to do and I don't do them. But I also know have got to be careful not to conjure up things just to do, just to try to praise the Lord. Because that's useless. That's, that's, that's even worse, to be honest. That's, that's just religion. But this... this it came to me, thou shalt serve no other gods before me. And when you said the word center, that's what really, that's the crux of the matter from, from what Tony said, what everything was said is, for those of you who, who may not know the Lord, and you're seeking him, and for those of who have and have, I guess, possibly fallen asleep or gotten lazy, call it like it is, at some point, either way, Christ is not the center, and that's the problem. That's the crux of the matter, and I'm talking to me too. Is that is that if if I was reading in Matthew seven, which I read through the whole thing, it was un, I never really read through the whole thing. Like it was unbelievable. I'll tell you what, Jesus does give some exact direction for the people in that. You know, he 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 reveals some little nuggets of the heart of God in some specific matters in certain things. But uh, one thing that stuck out to me is when, when Tony was. Talking to Canaan, he says, you shall know them by their fruit, which he was referring to talking about false prophets, but I believe that applies to any of God's people. He says, how can a, you know, you're going to get grapes from a fig tree or, uh, or figs from a thorn? No, you're going to get good fruit from the good fruit tree. And uh, this is what the Lord said at the end of it. He says, uh, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. He's referring to himself right there. That we have built, that our life centers around the foundation like Tony talked about. We don't need to go back to the foundation. The foundation is Christ. He's, he is telling us to move on and to trust in him and to make him the very fabric of our lives. That's why we're here. Why were we born? Why are, why are we saved? Other than to be made like him and to serve him and to draw others to him for the sake of his family and uh, that's the vision that's the great vision i appreciate the lord tonight i appreciate his word and uh let's let's um let's ask the lord to touch our hearts let's pray here tonight let's ask god to make himself so real to us that it is the cry of our hearts 
to do these works, not in our own flesh, not in our own strength, but for his glory, for his kingdom, for his sake, and by his strength. Let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to open our eyes to what this life is really all about. And I know he's touching on a lot of us tonight. I don't know, we, we have a pretty uh, lazy life here in America, pretty easy easy going life. And uh, I think God is calling us to be, like Tony said, we're called to be beacons in this world. Living epistles read and known of all men. But we can't do that without Christ being the center and being the power behind it. Let's, let's go to the Lord here.